In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his, his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your rel relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to, ta to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Lord, thank you that for your word that you give us to, to teach us, to help us to grow, to, um, to speak to our lives where we are, and to help us to understand you better. And I pray, Lord, that you would use these weak words of mine to be able to help us to understand better why you came, who you are, and what you're calling us to do. Lord, please give me the strength to do this and take this time. It's yours. Do whatever you like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're continuing our journey through the Apostles' Creed. Now, this was written in the early days of the Christian church. Probably the first appearance of a creed like it was about 300 AD, and the creed we have now was probably about 700 AD. And it was a way that the church wanted to summarize all the basic beliefs of Christianity kind of in one concise document. Like I said about this guy who can take a complicated thing and reduce it to an eight-word sentence. The church wanted to do that and take all the beliefs of Christianity and kind of summarize it in a concise way. And in those days, many heresies abound. Many people came up, they would write books, they would pass letters around outlining their view of who they thought Jesus was and, and what salvation meant. And there were lots of different views, lots of contradictory views, lots of views that didn't jive with what the scripture said. And some of them sounded pretty good. Some of them sounded right, but there was always one thing that kind of just made it kind of off. And so the church felt it was really important to create a creed, to create something that would kind of build a fence, create parameters around belief so that we, the church would know that if it was in, within this fence, then it's what God wanted to teach us through scriptures. And if it was outside, then you probably need to give it a second, a second thought, and, and and kind of you know examine it a little bit, a little bit closer. 
And also many people were illiterate in those days, and so they needed to be taught in ways that they, they couldn't read the scriptures for themselves. It's one of the reasons why churches have stained glass windows with the stories of different Bible stories in the windows, because people who couldn't read were able to see what the stories were and learn about them by being explained that this is the story that was in the stained glass window. So memorizing the creed, a simple creed, helped people have a solid grasp of their faith and of their belief. Now, the Apostles' Creed and reciting it or singing it isn't really part of Baptist tradition. I was actually introduced to it in a Pentecostal Bible college, and it's not, not Pentecostal tradition either. But our prof made us memorize it because he thought it was an important part of us, to, thing for us to learn, a part of Christian history, an important thing for us to, to, to internalize the basic truths of Christianity. And today many Christian churches, Catholic, Anglican, Lutheran, Methodist, many others will recite the Apostles' Creed almost every Sunday. So today's portion that we want to look at, we've been doing this for about six weeks, and today's portion we want to look at is the line that says, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. So for the next few weeks we're going to talk about this and we're going to talk about he was crucified and dead and buried, so we're going to talk about Christmas and Easter in October. Hope that's okay with everybody. It's a central part of the Christmas story, right? That Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. And it's also a central part to our faith as Christians as well. It's only found discussed in two passages. It's in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25, which presents the story from Joseph's perspective. And then the passage which Christine read for us from Luke 1, which gives Mary's side of the story. And in both instances, an angel appeared. What was going to happen to Mary and Joseph was going to be so out of the ordinary and so really difficult to have happen to them that they needed angelic reassurance that, hey, God's in this, God's in charge of this, and things are going to be okay. Now, the idea of the virgin birth has been kind of mocked and dismissed by people throughout the centuries, even to today. Sometimes when I try, I've worked with teenagers for many years, and sometimes when I've tried to explain it to young people, Fortunately, they have a bit of a warped view of what sex is about, and they come up with comments that I don't even want to repeat about what the virgin birth is about. But I guess in some ways, it is difficult in our finite minds to, to understand and wrap our heads around such a miracle. Trying to understand the virgin birth in our finite minds, trying to understand this miracle can be difficult. There's some things about this concept, this doctrine, this belief that we need to understand. First of all, Jesus was not just was not created at his birth. We talked a couple of weeks ago about the person of Jesus and who he was, and that Jesus is eternal. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have existed from the beginning of time. In Genesis, we read God saying, let us create humans in our own image. Let us, plural. He turned to his Son, Jesus the Son, he turned to the Holy Spirit and said, let us, three, the Trinity, create. Jesus is not a created being. I forgot, it's still in my car, I forgot to bring it, but Paul sent me an article this week from Christianity Today that talked about how people who spend a lot of time in church and espouse the, a lot of the basic beliefs of a church still have some very different ideas. And the, I think what the percentage was like about 50% of Americans who attend church regularly believe that Jesus was created, that Jesus didn't always exist. So that's why it's so important to go through things like this, to be able to understand the truth of what the gospel is preaching. There was an ancient guy named Arius back in 2-300 AD, and that's what he told everybody. He said Jesus was a created being. He was created by God as just the, you know, high, highly above the rest of us, but not equal to God, which is not what scripture teaches us. Jesus was not created. He always was. He's the most unique individual in history. When he when Mary gave birth to him and he lived and he walked among us, he, I always describe him as the only 200% person in history. The only 200% person in history because he was 100% God and 100% human at the same time. To his eternal, to his eternally existing divinity, he adds humanity. He didn't lose any of the attributes of being God. He just added being a human. And the virgin birth was the starting point of the God man. The one who has God has the power to save us. And the one who as a human is able to, ser to serve as the one who can save us. Another thing to 
realize what the virgin birth is, that Jesus' birth was actually a normal human birth, complete with Mary's screams and Joseph's reassurances, or Joseph's trying to hide, I'm not sure what fathers do, even back then, uh, complete with, you know, the baby crying, a completely normal human birth. And it's important to know that Jesus experienced the full range of human existence, right from the moment of birth, right through growing up as a young man, through living through adulthood. And he did this so that he could be the sinless human sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that he can experience humanity so that he could empathize with our weaknesses. When we call out to Jesus for help, we are calling out to someone who knows what we're going through because he's been there. And he has the power to help us because he's God. Mary became pregnant through a supernatural influence of the Holy Spirit upon her. The pregnancy and birth were like any other. It was how it all got started. That was the miracle. No human male involved. And that's where some people shake their heads. And the only way, I have a hard time understanding that. The only way to explain it is that it was a miracle. It was a miracle. And for some, that's hard to fathom. Some people just don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in God, or maybe they believe in a God, but don't believe that he, that he cares about us, or that he wants to be involved, or that he can turn aside the natural laws of nature. Some believe in God, but they have such a high regard for nature and the created order, and the laws of nature that God's created, they, they argue that God would never go against the laws of nature, so why would he do that? And it's true that God has created an incredibly ordered universe, but God is still sovereign. God is still in charge. And if he has a plan and a purpose in mind that would involve bending or even breaking the laws of nature to accomplish his will, he can do it. And he will do it because he's sovereign. And if we don't understand it, well, basically the, the answer is that God is God and we're not. And in our finite minds, we can't wrap our heads around all that God wants to do and all that his plans are. The virgin birth reminds us of the miraculous power of God. He's able to do whatever he wants for the good of his human creation and for his glory. The virgin birth reminds us of the sovereignty of God, that he is in charge, which is actually a pretty comforting notion when you look around at some of the craziness going on in his world, this world that, that God is still sovereign. God is still on the throne. God is still in charge. Various theologians over the, over the centuries have debated why the virgin birth is important. And the ancient church father, Tertullian, said that the virgin birth, birth was necessary for the incarnation. The incarnation is when God became man through Jesus Christ and walked among us. The way God chose to create the 200% human necessary to carry out his salvation plan was through the virgin birth. Through virgin conception, virgin birth, Jesus possesses the fullness of God and the fullness of humanity. Now, the theologian Millard Erickson outlines four important things we can learn from the virgin birth, and I thought I'd share them, and they touch a bit on what we've already talked about. First, it provides evidence of the power and sovereignty of God over nature. We've talked about that. Secondly, it provides evidence of the uniqueness of Jesus the Savior. He's not just any man. He's not just even a slightly elevated man from the rest of us. He is unique. He is fully God and fully human. Third, it is a reminder that God's salvation is fully of gift of grace. It's not, our being saved is not a, a, a human accomplishment. It's not something we can, we can strive for, we can earn. It wasn't our idea in the first place. God reached down to us, to humanity. And he provided the means and the grace by which we can be saved, by which we can have the broken relationship with our Creator restored once again. And fourth, it's the virgin birth is a reminder that our salvation is supernatural. It's evidence of the Holy Spirit's activity at the beginning of Jesus' earthly life. And the activity of the Holy Spirit continues to this day in our lives, in the life of the church, in the life of society as a whole. We looked a couple of weeks ago at how it is Christ who is holding everything together, is Christ through his Holy Spirit who holds the order of the universe together. But amidst all this theological understanding of the virgin birth, amidst what it means to our, underst the, our understanding of the, our faith, to our understanding of who Jesus is, there's also a very personal story going on here that we can learn from. 
It's the story of two fairly ordinary young people who loved God and served God and whose lives were changed forever. And because of that, they're remembered through the ages. Now, history would tell us that Mary was probably a fairly young girl, possibly as young as 14, maybe most likely 16. The teenager, as we know it today, is a fairly recent phenomenon, early 20th century. You know, back in, you know, before that and to, to Bible times, it was not unusual for 15, 16-year-olds to be married and to, to move on with their life as adults. Joseph was probably in his late teens, maybe 20. And she was engaged to be married to Joseph. And, and back then, engagement meant a little more than it does now. It was a very, very strong level of commitment. You could not break an engagement easily. It's not, it wasn't the same as marriage. It was, there was still one extra step for marriage, but you, it was really a big deal to break an engagement. So an angel appears to this engaged young lady and they have a conversation that consists of three parts. The first part, the angel greets her and tells her that she's highly favored by God. And her response is that she's troubled. What could the angel's words mean? It struck me that she wasn't troubled by the presence of an angel. She was troubled by the words. I think she had a strong enough faith in God and believed in God enough and, and who he was that the appearance of an angel before her, well, that's God's work. It's a miracle. I believe in a God of miracles. But it was what he said that's kind of like that I'm highly favored by God. What's this mean? Perhaps she was humbled. She was a very humble person. And perhaps she was humbled by what the angel was saying about her being highly favored. In the second part of the conversation, the angel explains God's plan. She was going to have a baby, a son, who would be named Jesus. And he will be called the Son of the Most High and would sit on the throne of David, ru ruling over an eternal kingdom. In other words, he would be the long-awaited Messiah that the Jewish people were waiting, waiting for. And her response to that was very practical. It was like, well, how? I'm a virgin. How can that possibly happen? Naturally speaking, this cannot happen. She didn't question that it would happen. She didn't kind of go, yeah, right, sure, this is never going to happen, <laughs> and just kind of dismiss it. She kind of questioned, okay, well, if this is going to happen, how? Because it doesn't make sense naturally. In the third part of the conversation, the angel explains how God's plan was going to come about. The scripture says the power of the Holy Spirit would overshadow her, and the one born in her would be the Son of God. For nothing God promises will ever, will ever fail. Nothing is too difficult for God. And her response this time was obedience. She said, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left. Can you imagine what's been going through her mind the minute the angel left? After all this information had been given to her, it'd be like, why me? <laughs> Out of all the thousands of young women in, 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 in Judea, in Israel, um, out of all the thousands of young Jewish women, why me? When she gives a prayer of praise later on in, in, in chapter 1, she says, My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She says, Generations will call me blessed, for God has done great things for me. She seems to have a handle on what she's been chosen to do. This is, this is a big deal. And she's rejoicing at being part of God's plan. But yet, what would Joseph say? I mean, how could he believe that I haven't cheated on him? What will my family say? I mean, I'll bring disgrace on my family. I'll be, I'll be an outcast. If I tell them <laughs> that God is the father of my child, they didn't use the term mentally ill back then, or, you know, they'd be like, they'll think I'm, they'll think I'm, crazy. And more than that, they'll, they'll say, I'm blasphemous, that I'm blasphemous, that the God's the father of your child. And what would the village say? In those days, a very patriarchal society, in those days, a woman caught in adultery would be stoned to death, guilty of death. It happened in is a story later in Jesus' life when a woman is dragged before him, having been caught committing adultery. And he releases her, saying to everybody around, said, well, whoever of you has never done anything wrong, you throw the first stone at her. And they all stopped and kind of went, yeah, you're right. And they all kind of walked away. And Jesus said to her, you know, who's condemning you? And she said, 
Well, nobody, they're gone. And he said, I don't condemn you anymore. I don't condemn you either, but go now and sin no more and, and leave your life of sin. Just an example of in those days, you know, the law took that very seriously. This accepting this to happen to her could mean death. Accepting this assignment from God can mean the end of her marriage. Unmarried women who were not cared for in those days were counted as nothing in society. Widows, unmarried women, um, were, they were not the social safety network we have now. They were, they were counted as nothing. It would be the end of the community around her. She'd be a disgrace to her family. She would be considered outcast. She, she went and stayed with her cousin Elizabeth, as Christine read, for, for three months to just to kind of get away and kind of wrap her head around what's going on and be safe. But she was going to have to face the community at some point. It could mean the end of her life if they took the law seriously and stoned her to death. What would, now, what do you think Joseph was going through once he finds out, once Mary tells him? He's confused. He's heartbroken. He said, I thought Mary was different. I thought she loved God. I, I thought she wanted to build a life with me. And if he was devoted to what the law said must be done. He was a very religious person. But he loved Mary very much. And so he said, Scripture says that he decided to divorce her quietly so as not to disgrace her, to not make a big deal about it, to not demand that there be justice or revenge, but just to kind of quietly just let this just kind of go away and so that she would not be hurt and would, would be safe. There's upheaval in both these young lives because of God's plan for them and because of God's plan for the world. But then an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream, Matthew chapter 1 tells us, and he explained everything that had happened to Mary and what was going to happen. And Joseph's response was like Mary's. It was this response of obedience. Joseph obeyed the angel's message and took Mary as his wife. But again, what would his family say? What would society say? How can you take her as your wife after what she did? She cheated on you. How, how, how do you know she won't do it again? Can you really raise a child that's not your own? These two young people were really very alone. No one believed them. No one accepted them. Everyone thought they were crazy. Mary for believing her baby was God's and Joseph for still taking her as his wife. All they had was each other and God and God's promises. And for them, that was enough. See, God has a plan and a purpose for each of our lives. And it, I say it here, may not be as earth shattering. It probably won't be as earth shattering as what Mary and Joseph had to go through. It may not change the whole world. But God may have a plan and purpose for your life that working through you might change the little world around you. And he's looking for people who, like Mary, will say, I am the Lord's servant. May your plan and purpose be fulfilled in me. And the question is, will you be that one? Will you be the one to fulfill God's plan and purpose for your life? And before you answer yes, because some people answer yes too quick, before you answer yes, realize the cost. Count the cost involved. You, by taking hold of what Jesus' plan is for your life, what God's plan is for your life, you could be ostracized from your family who don't understand your desire to, to live for God and live for Jesus. There will be people around you who misunderstand and they'll assume the worst in you, like people assume the worst in Mary. There will be people who I think will think you're just crazy. You may experience rejection. You may wonder, like Mary did, how is the plan and purpose going to come about? God may have a promise, give you a promise that he's going to do something in your life, but doesn't show you how. And you wonder, how is this going to come about? Humanly speaking, it seems, if not impossible, at least it seems like quite a mountain to climb. Are you sure you're up to it? Let me tell you that God's strength in you will give you the strength so that you are up to it. Count the cost of following Jesus like Mary and Joseph did. Count the cost of saying, whatever you want to do with me, Lord, I'm okay with that. There is a cost to being a serious follower of God, but is there ever a reward? For if you step out in obedience to what God is clearly telling you to do, he will bless you. He will do mighty things in you and through you. He will help you to leave a legacy. What he does through you will last beyond your reach, beyond the scope of your own lifetime even. You will truly know the purpose for your life. 
You will truly know why you're here. You will truly know what you were created for. And God will be glorified and God will be lifted up. And God, Jesus says, when I am lifted up, then he will draw all people to himself. The virgin birth is an important aspect to our faith and it plays an important role in what we believe. But it also tells us a story that requires us to put our faith into action, to trust God, even when things seem impossible, and to obey him. Yes, there will be difficulties. Yes, there will be challenges. But as you step out in faith, and as you do what God is putting on your heart to do, and as he clearly has led you to do, you will be blessed. May I pray with you? Would you bow your heads and let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for this story that sometimes we pass over at Christmas time. Lord, thank you for giving Mary and Joseph the strength to go through what they did. I pray that you'd help us to gain a deeper understanding, help us to put ourselves in their sandals and to realize the cost that they paid, or they could have paid, um, to follow you. And Lord, I pray that um, you would help us to count the cost as well. Thank you, Lord, that you have a plan and purpose for every person in this room. And I pray, Lord God, that you'd give us the strength and the courage to step out and to accept you into our lives and to accept your plan and purpose for our lives. And Lord, as we do, I pray that you would help us through those difficult times when people think that we've gone off the deep end, when people don't understand us, when people don't understand the passion that we have for you. And I pray, God, that uh, you would give us the strength to uh, keep moving forward in what you've called us to do. Thank you, God, that we are not here by accident, that we're not here by random chance, that you created each one of us for, with, for a purpose and with, and with a plan in mind. And I just pray, Lord, by your spirit that you would speak to us gently this week and give us a clearer picture of what that purpose and plan is and then give us the courage to trust you to step out. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.